Um, welcome to everyone and thank you for attending our copyright awareness event today. My name is Kim Mazik. I'm the manager for Montezuma Publishing. My colleagues and I are prepared to introduce and review copyright best practices. Um, so I want to introduce uh, my colleagues. Uh, Sarah Baird, she is from the SDSU Library and Information Access, and Phil Denman, who is from Instructional Technology Services. Um, our learning objectives for today are to increase copyright, copyright awareness on campus, to make sure that you know your rights, to make sure that you understand your limitations, and to learn about the resources that are available to you on campus. I want to let you know that we are recording this session today. Um, it'll be used for faculty and staff who were unable to be here today. Sarah is going to start the program. I am going to speak second. And then we're going to take a small break so that we can get our lunches. And then once we've done that, Phil is going to come forward to the podium. And Phil has a lot of great discussion questions uh, to go over with you. I think you'll find that part really enjoyable. Um, before you leave, you'll notice on your table that you have an evaluation form, and I hope that you would take a few moments to fill that out for us. It's the only way that we are going to know if this event was uh, beneficial to you and how we can improve future events. So with that, again, I want to thank you all for coming. This is a really important topic, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Um, I also would like to welcome everyone and thank you for attending. It's very, this is indeed a very important topic and um, I've appreciated the time to be able to work the last few weeks, okay, let's be real, two weeks <laughs> with Phil and Kim uh, to pull this program together and I'm sure, certain there will be a number of questions when we're done. But this is the most important thing you all need to know, <laughs> the requisite disclaimer. Neither, none of us are lawyers. Um, nothing we say here can be construed as legal advice. Given that, uh, you might wonder why this is a topic of interest to us. For many years, starting um, somewhere in late 1995, early 1996, I was in charge of electronic course reserves. And one day my lead worker said to me, oh, you are going to be available for that meeting tomorrow with Montezuma Publishing on copyright, aren't you? And I said, who and what? I did not know what she was talking about. Little did I know that that was the beginning of a very long relationship with Montezuma Publishing. As it turns out, we were running electronic course reserves, and we were dealing with content all the time. So I got a quick lesson in copyright that changed some over the years as I learned a little bit more about the topic. Kim takes a, has a very operational approach to this because she's in charge of the course packs for Montezuma Publishing, both in print form and in digital form. So she deals with these copyright issues a lot. And Phil and his crew at ITS, of course, are working with the faculty in their Blackboard pages all the time, where content and how we use it and the appropriate use of content is a constant issue. Uh, I'm not going to spend time in this. Kim went over our learning objectives. We just hope you know more. We hope you know what you can do with other people's content, uh, what you can't, because there are some limitations, and where to get some help at San Diego State University. So first off, I would like to start by just by a, giving a definition of copyright. And there's definition at the United States Copyright Office. Uh, I have abridged it and changed it just a little bit. It's simply a, copyright is simply a form of protection for the author or creator of originally created works in tangible form. So original works, they're created. This is a protection to the author or the creator. This does not include ideas and it doesn't include lists. So I have an idea great, that's fine. Until it's in tangible form, you're not protected by copyright. Uh, the works that are covered are, include literary, musical. You can read the line here. Um, since the uh, a Copyright Act was started, architectural works have also been included. So any of these in tangible form are protected by copyright. Since 1978, both published and unpublished works are protected. Prior to 1978, you had to have that little copyright symbol. 
which meant that you'd gone to the copyright office and you'd gotten, you'd had your works registered. So you got the little copyright uh, symbol on there. But uh, that's no longer the case. Unpublished works are also protected and a work no longer has to include the copyright symbol since 1978 in order to be protected. Okay, what do these rights mean? You're the author of an article and you haven't yet given up your rights to the publisher. You have created a wonderful piece of sculpture. You have painted a really nice picture. You have the exclusive rights to reproduce that work to prepare derivative works, to distribute copies, and I re I'm repeating exclusive rights, to perform, in the case of a, a performance work, display or transmit. So you as the creator of the work, these are your rights. Now, can someone other than the author or creator of works hold copyright? Well, we all know that this is true. You as an author or creator may assign your rights to someone else. This is, of course, true in the case of authors who are getting books published. They assign their rights over to the publisher. Um, they often assign all their rights, and I would like to give one caution to faculty members. Um, play around with the contract. Enter into a little negotiation. See if you can hold on to a few copies for yourself. Usually what happens is authors assign the entire rights, and that means they do not any longer have the right to copy themselves or distribute themselves. So check your contracts when you are signing with the publisher. Other reasons that people may have, um, others may have a copyright claim is because the owner has leased their rights. Uh, so instead of assigning all the rights, they've given up some of the rights. And they'll, hire, they'll hire, sign lease agreements for that. The other reason is protection has expired. Copyright protection does not last forever. When the copyright law first came into effect, I believe it was for 20, 25 years, something like that, the time period for protection keeps expanding. It's currently approximately 70 years after the author's death. But it really does depend when the work was created. There are some calculators out there to help folks figure out if you're uh, if your work is expired or not. So I please do exercise a lot of caution on this one because the times do differ a little bit. The other reason you may not, as a creator, own your own work is because it's done in relation to your work for your employer. Now we have an interesting thing here at San Diego State. Professors, for the most part, own their work. That's, a, that's an agreement that has been made by our Senate and in most cases, the professors do retain rights to their work. But I'm a staff person. Everything I do, including this PowerPoint project, belongs to San Diego State University. So uh, work for hire or work for your employer are cases where the person who creates the work does not own it any longer. And then the other is many, though not all, government publications. The United States government is a wonderful publisher, and almost all of it belongs to all of us, which is a uh, very good thing, given the number of works that are published by the government. Now, are there any legal exemptions? We've talked about the exclusive rights that authors and creators have. We've talked about the, what those rights are. Are there exceptions? Is there any possibility that you can use somebody's work and you don't have to get permission? And of course, we know there are some of those exceptions. One of them is fair use. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about fair use in just a moment. The other is the TEACH Act. And Phil's gonna be talking about the TEACH Act. And I do recommend sticking around because he gave us a little test, the three of us, the other day. And we had quite a fun time arguing over some of them. So um, it'll be interesting to see the opinions on some of those folks, uh, this, with some of you folks. Um, there's also legal copying that libraries and museums are entitled to. Um, libraries for our archival documents or archival purposes, and also interlibrary loan. I'm sure some of you folks have used interlibrary loan. I know one person in this room who uses it a lot. Our borrowing coordinator is here from interlibrary loan. Um, interlibrary loan 
there are some rules. We're allowed to go up to five, after five, from a journal. And then in a calendar year, if we request, if we get requests for more than that for a journal we don't have in our collection, we have to pay copyright. And we pay tens of thousands of dollars in the library for copyright. Um, there are also exemptions to facilitate access for the visually impaired or uh, people with other disabilities. Okay, so what is fair use? Um, I, I, long ago, I was at a uh, workshop, and he said, the, the uh, instructor said, just think pain, because copyright's a pain. But he was using the window pane, and he, but for some reason, this has always stuck with me, and I think it might be a help to the rest of you, too. Um, play around with the word a little bit, but P-N-A-E. This is the heart of fair use. These, these, this is the criteria for a fair use in, um, analysis. One is the purpose of the use. This is easy for us in this room. If it's for nonprofit educational purposes, you may have a good chance of making a fair use argument, as opposed to commercial interests. So for most of us in this room, or the reason we're in this room, the purpose of the use is going to be just fine. The other is the nature of the, that should say nature of the work, I apologize. Um, if the work is, Nonfiction, it has a much you have a much better chance of making a fair use argument than if the work is uh, fiction. And then the question is the amount that you're copying, and that there are no guidelines. The law does not tell us how much is allowed and how much isn't. And basically, folks are out in the real world, world trying to figure out what is legal and what isn't all the time. Um, there are a few guidelines, but. Um, this is really a very difficult part of, of the uh, exemption. And then the last one is the effect or the potential effect on the market. Is your copying going to cut into the profits of an author or a publisher? And how much copying are you doing? Uh, if you do more, does that cut into the rights even more? So th that's kind of the fair use provision. Um, there are a number of legal cases that have tested fair use, and I'm not going to spend time on them, except I do want to quickly go over Kinko's, and I want to go over the Georgia State University case just a little bit. Kinko's, in, I believe it was 1989, was sued by eight textbook publishers. And the reason they were sued is because Kinko's was creating anthologies, we now call them course packs, but essentially, Faculty members were picking and choosing from chapters of books or articles out of journals and having those made into one single entity for sale to their students. Now, Kinko's did not um, acquire copyright. They were only charging for the printing, the copying, and probably a little profit on top of it. Uh, they claimed they had the right to do this because they were doing it for educational purposes. And they were sued, and it was a hefty lawsuit. They were found guilty, and they paid a very, very high fine. Now, it's interesting, those textbook publishers could have, if they had desired, also gone after the faculty members. They chose not to do this. But I think it is important to know, if you're the one who's filing a lawsuit, you get to choose who you're going after. In that case, they only went after Kinko's. Um, similar case with Princeton University Press in Michigan. It's a, a rather similar article. I want to spend a little time on Georgia State University. Uh, this was a case filed in 2008, three publishers against the university, but specifically cited were officers of the university. I believe it was the president, a provost, dean of the library, and an instructional technology uh, person. They were specifically cited. It was for electronic course reserves. When I talk about electronic course reserves, I'm talking about a service that is generally provided by libraries. It's essentially an online reading list that professors use. We had ECR years ago. Um, Troy was the last one, I think, who worked it. It was unfortunately a victim of budget cuts for us. But when I say electronic course reserves, a lot of times the discussion around that is very applicable to some of the content on Blackboard, so it does matter. At any rate, um, pub three publishers sued Georgia State for massive copyright infringement. 
georgia state was asked to come up with a copyright policy for their electronic course reserves it really mirrored the policy we had at san diego state very closely. it was pretty much what we were doing at the time, which is no surprise because a lot of the libraries were having policies very similar to one another there uh the case went before the judge the judge determined overwhelmingly in most cases that the library was within its rights for the copying it was doing on behalf of the publishers who then were having their students look at this material now the difficulty with this case is it looks like it's being appealed so we don't really know what the end reaction is there were a couple of things about that case that interested me a lot as somebody who had been doing uh, electronic course reserves in the past. One of the things that interested me was that while we were saying 15% of a, a work was probably acceptable, the judge in this case said 10%. So it moved it down a notch. And many in the library world have been very concerned about that. The other thing that she determined, which we really liked, was that uh, we'd always dealt with this idea of subsequent semester use. Can we use someone else's material, fall semester, use it again in the spring? And in her case, she said we could. So um, this case has had people really on edge for the last year and a half or so, um, two years, almost two years. Um, and we still don't know a lot of answers. But uh, anytime you see Georgia State, look at that. You'll know, know at least some background on it. Now, who can be accused of infringement? In the case of Georgia State, they actually didn't go after the university. They went after individuals. They went after presidents and vice presidents and um, an administrator. But it really is up to whoever is launching the lawsuit or the complaint who they want to go to. So um, no choice on that. Students can actually be accused of infringement. Faculty members can. So think about these things. I want to talk a little bit about a place to go to get some help. And I'm going to show you the, our library's research, uh, research guide. Um, there are a number of tools. It's full of a lot of information that I think will be helpful. So this is the uh, first page of the library's website. I'm not sure that it's all that clear. But under Find, just look for that first tab, um, Resource Guides. And just as we have guides for every subject, essentially, that's taught on this campus, we also have one for copyright. So if you click on that, and you're going to get to a screen that is full of information. There are tutorials on copyright. There are the fair uses um, defined for you. There are some best practices guides that I highly encourage people to read. There are also some handy little checklists. And I like the checklist that's provided, and we did get permission by Kenny Cruz from Columbia University, but there's a bunch of them out there. If you Google uh, copyright checklist, you'll find a bunch. And essentially, what the checklists do is it allows you to look at some material and say, does this seem like it's going to meet with fair use or not? And some of the arguments, not in their entirety, that favor fair use have got on the left-hand side, some of those that aren't as acceptable I have on the right hand side. Certainly teaching reader, uh, research and scholarship, you're going to have a better fair use argument than if you're copying work strictly for entertainment. I think that makes sense. Nonprofit educational versus commercial. Uh, it's absolutely within your rights to use materi material for parody, news reports, criticism. That's absolutely within your right. Um, bad faith, just to throw something out there because you don't like the person who wrote something, nah, that's not such a good, that one won't make a fair use argument. Um, on down the line, you have the list on your prints, but I think you can get an idea. You have the work and kind of make a balanced approach to that. So we're going to play a little game. I'm going to ask some questions. And I always get 100% any time I play these fair use games. And I'm going to tell you why. I always give the same answer. My answer is depends. And as long as you say that, you get 100%. But sometimes things are a little more yes and a little more no. So I'd like to just throw out some questions. You, can you make a fair use argument to make a digital print copy of an entire book published in 1848 to place on your Blackboard course, yes or no? Why? 
<laughs> okay, yeah. why? Okay, yeah, I, I think the preponderance is for the yeses, after depends. Okay, make a digital print copy of a children's book published in 2005 that is only 12 pages and contains no more than 50 words for my blackboard course. It's a real small little thing. Can you do that? I'm hearing no. Ooh, well, that's good. Okay, without that. <laughs> very good, very good. That's why all these answers is always is depends. Um, the answer is no, and I had a case on this years ago with electronic course reserves. The book was so small, we had it also on our bookshelves, but you, you would lose it in the bookshelves. But no, it was the entire work. And so it was not, it was not acceptable. Okay, make a digital copy of less than 5% of a current bestseller, but only the most significant and cited part of the book. Yes or no? No? This is kind of up in the air. There have been some court cases that have said no. There have been some that say yes. So it just kind of depends. Okay, which of the following may be fair use? A short, less than seven minutes clip on Blackboard of one of the motivating speeches in Remember the Titans. You all remember that movie, right? Um, this is for a business management class, and the ta the, today's lesson is how to motivate employees. The movie is one hour and 53 minutes. Fair use? Huh? <laughs> Depends. I think this is within fair use. I was in a class. They did this. I had no objections. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so you're the professor and you realize this movie is so good, I'm going to show the whole thing for the class. Fair use? Okay, what about on Blackboard? Fully online? Fully online? Yes? Okay, and this is where, uh, yeah, this is, we're going to have a lot of fun with Bill's stuff. <laughs> I would question it because is the whole movie applicable to your course? And actually, I'm kind of cheating because that goes a little more into the TEACH Act. So maybe that was a little unfair for this. Yeah, but I mean, there are some times where I think a whole movie is acceptable. I think there are some times. I'm not sure in this case the way I laid it out it would necessarily be. Okay, the last. Post the entire list of all nominees and major categories from last year's Academy Awards for your television, film, and new media class. You guys are good. You guys are really good. Yeah, if there's any value added, if there's some pictures along with it, but if it's just a list, yeah, it's a list and it's not protected. So that would be fine. Um, I have some resources. They're available in the PowerPoint slide. Uh, again, please look at the library's resource guide. I think it's absolutely excellent. Lots of questions will be answered, I think. Um, my gratitude to Columbia University and Kenny Cruz for use of his, um, his checklist, which we have posted on our website. I also would like to encourage people, if you have some questions, to check out uh, CSU Long Beach. The um, uh, associate dean of the library there, Tracy Mayfield, is a real champion on copyright issues. She's working very closely with the chancellor's office right now to get a unified approach to copyright for all the CSU. She offered to let me use her slides, and I would have done so, but they were so good, I thought, no, next year I want her to come speak to us. So I'm uh, hoping, but anyway, she was certainly willing, and I was very appreciative of that. And always the U.S. Copyright Office, the source of some very good information. Thank you.